when I was in my undergraduate studies, I sat next to this woman named Heather and she would always write out her, her like expenses for the month next to me while we were in class. And obviously that's at the front of her mind. And I feel like that's a normal, real reaction to the limitations of our world. And I wanted to put people like that into my novel. I'm Nathan Maharaj, and this is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is novelist Kylie Reed, author of the 2020 novel, Such a Fun Age. Her new book, Come and Get It, is set on the campus of the University of Arkansas, specifically at a dormitory called Belgrade. And it follows Millie Cousins, a 24-year-old resident advisor, or RA to folks familiar with dorm life, who's launching a second run at the final year of her degree after taking time off to look after her mother, while she also quietly inches towards buying a little house. Kylie Reed, welcome to Kobo. Thank you for having me. That was a great intro. <laughs> I try. Um, the book is set, come and get it, it's set in 2017. It's not just pre-pandemic, because that's a decision novelists have to make now. It's barely post-Obama. Why? It is just post-Obama, very purposefully. Uh, a few reasons. I feel that big life events such as a pandemic make a lot more sense to me in the rear view. I could never write them during Conf like during that period, like confidently, I'd rather see what they look like when we've come out, quote unquote, out of that period. So I wanted to place the book in 2017 for a few reasons. I didn't want the 2016 election to take up more space and take attention away from these characters. I wanted them to have an exception of, of the time that they were in and so that their own drama could seem a bit bigger. I also lived in Fayetteville, Arkansas from August of 2016 to August 2017. And so I wanted the Fayetteville that I knew to exist really perfectly. So I had lots of plans of revisiting Fayetteville while I was writing, but those got demolished by the pandemic. And so I just had to really say, okay, it's 2017. And I went into Google Maps and made sure the locations and restaurants and bars and bookstores were all exactly as I remember them. So I could really capture that specific place and time. Part of me also suspected that 2017 might've been like the last moment, like the last grain of sands and the hourglass falling through when anyone, anybody anywhere could realistically like buy a house near yeah. where they work using only money they earned from their work. Um, and, and, uh, and it, it, it's interesting when you look at the math that, uh, of, of it's still a bit of a stretch for Millie. We're going to get to that in a sec, but we should, we should, we should talk more about characters as we, as we get into this. I spoke a little bit about Millie. We're going to talk a lot about Millie, but there's a couple of other significant characters here. Can you introduce us to uh, the esteemed visiting writer, Agatha Paul? Sure. Agatha Paul is just turning 38 years old. She is a white woman who lives in Chicago as an assistant professor at the University of DePaul. She is a bit neurotic. She's very curious. She has a sophistication to her. She um, decided to downsize all of her belongings. So she owns exactly 50 pieces of, of things that she wears on her person. Agatha is coming to Fayetteville after breaking up with her wife, Robin, and she's terribly lonely. She's looking to have her next beat as a journalist and finish her next book, which will be her third book. And she has this vision of her time in Fayetteville, almost like a rumspringa. She's thinking, this year doesn't count. This year is going to get me back up on my feet. And I think it's that perspective that Fayetteville doesn't matter as much that gets her in a bit of trouble. We we meet her as she's interviewing students uh, for this book for this third book. Uh, she thinks it's 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 a it's going to be uh, about weddings. She wants to hear these young women speaking uh, about their their thoughts on on getting married and 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 all of the ceremony around that. Um, but the first thing we learn about Agatha's interior life, or the first thing that I where I felt like I knew something about her interior life, 
was uh, where she's defined in many ways by things that get on her nerves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we learn we learn through uh, the context being a point of friction with Robin, um, from whom she separated, um, that when Agatha, uh, when she's complaining about the last four books she's read being like that they were terrible, um, that Robin's reading of it is like, hey, maybe you don't like reading. And that, of course, annoys Agatha. Uh, I think Agatha, my reading is that, uh, of her is that she loves reading because, and, and, and I related in a way I, that she, she's getting something from, from all of these things that annoy her are, are in the way of something she loves. They're, they're, they're blocks to passions. Um, as a bookseller, I have to like ignore 99.9% of books. And then the ones I pick up are like, well, that's not, that's not hitting me the way, the way I want it to hit. Um, but, but let me ask you is how much of, how much of you is in, is in Agatha? You want to know if I hate all of those things? <laughs> yeah. You know, is, is burlesque uh, a, a just an annoying, silly thing to you? Or is it just Agatha? I'm pretty neutral on burlesque. Yeah. Um, there's a few things in there that I don't like. I think that, you know, I think every writer lets a few of those things slip out because they understand those, those feelings. Um, with Agatha, yeah, I think you hit it on the head. She has a fierce curiosity about the world, but she also has very strong opinions as to how people are living their lives. And Robin, her her now ex-wife, is someone who's a bit more spontaneous and, and doesn't, um, it's not that she doesn't think as deeply. I think that Robin has an intellectual and analytical side to her as well, but she just doesn't let herself be bothered by things that don't have anything to do with her. Agatha, in her journalist mind, she sees things and she has a big opinion on them, such as free little libraries and photo booths at weddings. I don't love those. So that's that's one I can share with yep. her. <laughs> she gets a big annoyance out of uh, people giving their dogs human food, things like that. So all of these little things that, you know, no one should go to jail for, but but aren't exactly right. So while all of her disinterests aren't the same as mine, I think that we have a similarity and interest in, in those types of things human behavior that makes you feel a bit off kilter and things that people do that affect you, even though they aren't happening to you. So I think that we have similar interests, um, albeit not all of the same penchants for things. It's, you mentioned that, yeah, that Robin doesn't struggle with this. Um, it's, um, and, and I, and I noted, yeah, Robin is a, Robin is, is a professional artist. I mean, they're both creative people. They both, they are, they are creative professionals. Um, Robin, Robin seems perfectly capable of tolerating mediocrity um, between moments of greatness uh, where, where Agatha seems, seems just like the mediocrity is, is agony to her. A bit. So yes, she's someone who, you know, the way that people spend their money has nothing to do with her, but it stresses her out and it annoys her deeply. I personally think that we all have something like that, that we're like, you know what? I know that this has nothing to do with me, but I hate that it's happening and I don't want to be in the presence of it. And so Agatha is someone that I wanted to to turn those things up. And we're seeing all of these characters at a very specific moment in their lives. I also think that a character's annoyance to something um, is attributed by the rest of their lifestyle. So if Agatha felt more of a security within her relationship with Robin, I'm sure that those money issues would seem far less important than they do. But there's something about Robin and her youth and her beauty that Agatha feels like she's always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And so those little annoyances, I think, seem a bit bigger than they should be. Mm. Uh, on the subject of youth, uh, there are a bunch of dorm residents, of course, uh, that I mentioned as uh, that Agatha is uh, is interviewing. Uh, there are ones she's not interviewing. They're all over the place. We're at a university. We're in a dorm. We get to know a few of them. Uh, the ones that we really get to know are the trio that shares a suite, which is a which is an unusual piece of the architecture of of this residence. But but the one we I think I think we get to know best. Um, is Kennedy, but we get to know her really slowly. Uh, it takes a while before we before we um, kind of get inside of her experience. Can you tell me a little bit about this this troubled young lady, Kennedy? Sure. So Kennedy is from Iowa, and she is a transfer student, and she's starting as a junior at the University of Arkansas. 
for you're you're totally right. We get to learn her a bit slowly, and we also get to know her through her items because Kennedy has brought a ton of stuff. So much stuff. So much too much <laughs> stuff into her room, which causes a bit of drama with who is living where and, and how that person's going to fit into their their room. Kennedy and her mom are very close. She has a lot of brothers and sisters, but they're much older. And her father has died when she was a child. And so she's very close to her mother. And after a traumatic incident in her sophomore year of school, Kennedy is looking to start over completely. I wanted Kennedy to be a weird roommate to the reader for as long as possible. <laughs> the reader to say, okay, this girl is off. She has a lot of stuff. She can't really understand how to make friends in a really natural way. Something's holding her back. And I wanted the reader to have a little bit of frustration with her in the same way that her roommates might before learning where she came from, because I think that that's most realistic to, to real life. Um, I had a few very young people read early drafts of the novel just to make sure I was getting everything right. And they all had a really similar and interesting re response to Kennedy. They said, you know what? I know this girl. I've seen her and I feel bad for her, but stay away from me. I don't want that near me. There was something about her loneliness and desperation that was very unappealing. And I, and I wanted to keep that throughout. I think that Kennedy is someone who represents a loneliness and a confusion of what to do in a dorm when you're living by yourself for the first time. And for her, it, it's kind of like if the dorm was a world of capitalism, friends or currency, and she can't figure out how to get them. They're like a credit card. She needs mm. credit to get a credit card, but she doesn't have a credit card to get credit. And it's this loop that she can't seem to make her way out of. Among the many things uh, Kennedy brings with her, uh, is uh, we get a we get a glimpse of of her books. Uh, she's bringing she's she's got some books with her. She has Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist, which doesn't tell us a lot. It's like one of the most popular books in the world, and it's and as it's only as a snooty bookseller that I have managed to not have a copy of it in my home. Otherwise, I think they just it just shows up automatically. Um, she's also got Brene Brown's Rising Strong, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, she has a fictional book, a book that does not exist, and it's called Satellite Grief, The Science and Secondary Response from Inciting Accidental Death, authored by Agatha Paul. Mm -hmm. I love this. I love I love so much about this. I love the character insight of of seeing what kind of what what books people have. I think we all do. We all like snooping bookshelves. But I also loved. The. Um the elision into a character insight about Agatha Paul, that, that, that this person who is all, all, all put together, all buttoned up. Um, why would she have this? Why would she, who we met working on what sounds like, what sounds like a, a like a, you know, New York times bestseller nonfiction book about weddings. Why would she have this academic sounding book about causing harm this way? Can you tell me about about that structure about um, about bringing bringing Agatha into Kennedy's life through her book? Yes, I love seeing the connections that characters have between themselves. And Agatha will fully admit that she wrote this book when she was in her mid twenties. And while she's not embarrassed of it, she doesn't stand by it as a writer anymore, which I think is something that many writers, myself included, can relate to. Mm -hmm. The way that that books happen is that you spend few years or decades pouring yourself into something and then you change as a person. And then that thing comes out into the world a year or two after you wrote it and you're excited to celebrate it, but you are a very different person. With my first book, I when I first started it, I was closer to the young woman Amira's age. And now, and when I finished it, I was closer to the mother's age. And so am I still very proud of that work? Absolutely. But as an artist, you just change completely. So I think the word that Agatha uses is there's the there's what I wrote it for and there's what people use it for. Mm -hmm. And James Baldwin talks about, you know, there's the book you want to write. And then the thing that comes out is the book that you settle for. And Agatha is on the other end of people reading her book as self-care and self-help. And that's not really why she set out to write it. It was more of a reflection of, an accidental death that she was a part of when she was in high school. And so I loved the idea of bringing Kennedy and Agatha together this way and, and Agatha representing 
you know, almost a therapist that properly and positively diagnoses Kennedy and tells her she's going to be okay without even having met her. So I, I loved having that connection between them. And it's very nice to talk to a bookseller about this who cares about the books on people's shelves because so much went <laughs> into the books on people's shelves. Yes. I mean, it's my next question uh, because because I need to know about these little piles of books, these little like bouquets that like Tyler, who is the um, kind of the ringleader of the trio in the yes. in the I mean, not that they are a ring. Uh, they're not a cohesive unit, but they all they do live in the suite, the three of them. And mm -hmm. Tyler has Tina Fey's bossy pants. Uh, yeah. It's 2017. I think it was the best, like the number one best selling book of like 2016. It was like one or two percent of like total book sales or something. It was bananas. Uh, she also has the Jojo Moyes book, Me Before You. Um guaranteed tear jerker. Uh, but then she also has Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, mm -hmm. which I I think I think as a reader, I I I I questioned whether she'd read it. <laughs> <laughs> but Millie, our kind of our main character, we we learn that she has a copy of uh Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's uh Americana. Mm -hmm. Wonderful novel. I'm a fan. Uh The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Uh I've read that. I thought that I love I loved that because it's a little late. Yeah. Like for that to be hanging around her was like, oh, do you still That's true. It's a little late. Yes. I remember that was the the all school read when I was a freshman in college. So that was in 2005 or seven, depending on what school. So yeah, she's a little bit late. I love that. Uh, and then she's reading the girl on the train, which again is one of those. Uh, she, so she and, and Tyler have in common that like susceptibility to like blockbuster bestseller phenomena. The eclecticism though, w what I loved about each of these is th there's that eclecticism that uh, kind of thwarted my ability to judge these characters. Like it, it I was drawn one way and then pushed another and then felt bad about being judged and or about judging them. Tell me about these bouquets of books as you put them together. I, this is so silly, but there are certain parts of your novel that you pour so much into like two lines. And so this is one of my favorite questions. I've only been asked once another time on this tour. So I'm thrilled to talk about these books. Um, I had a research assistant on this book, which was fantastic because she's so bright and quick and smart. And on a basic level, I could say things like, I need a last name for Robin. Can you get me traditionally black names from this time period in Chicago? And she would come up with a list of 20 and sometimes I would pick. Or I could say, um, I need the salaries of RAs in the South at seven different schools and then I could make my own. These little bouquets of books were that, but one of the more fun things that we could brainstorm together. It was a time where I could figure out who these characters were on my own. And then just knowing who they were, it, I think it made the writing and dialogue more true. With Millie, you're right, on a little bit is late, but I feel, I felt very strongly that it would be a book that she read in school and she would have the hardcover and it would look nice and she would feel guilty getting rid of it. Like maybe I'll go back to reading about corn. I don't know. And then keep that book. I felt that Americana was something that her mother would give her. I felt that Sweet Bitter was something that she would have her hands on and Girl on the Train, maybe she read in two days like I did. One thing I'm really obsessed with in literature that I'm writing is normalness. I think that when we think of a campus novel, we often think of Ivy Leagues, top of the top, cathedrals, um, New England, when most people in the United States are going to state schools at places like the University of Arkansas. I love reading about normal salaries and rooms and, and consumption choices, and I wanted to, those to reflect in the books these people are reading as well. When I was on tour for such a fun age, many people told me, I had not read a book in four years. This one got me back. And it was one, the most touching thing, but two, like a great place to understand how most people read. I feel very strongly that most people, whether they know it or not, really like to read, but do not have the time to figure out what they like to read. And then when they do have the time, they're like, oh, this one's, everyone loves this. Let me go pick up this one. This one mm -hmm. should be fine. And I think that that's where Millie and Kennedy are operating from. Most of my students are so busy reading textbooks that they don't have time to, you know, get to the nitty gritty. They want to say, oh, this one's probably worth my time. I'll, I'll pick this one up. And so that's what I was going for with Millie and Tyler. I do think for, for Tyler, a room of one's own, I think that maybe she had to buy it for a class and then read a few chapters and kind of liked it and keeps it on her shelf because of how it looks. 
Um, Colette is the only other person who has a stack of books and hers are a bit more niche as I feel like Colette is probably at the library in the depths of, of her interest. She has Jane Fonda's memoir. She has Banan's book. She has The Lover. And I think she has another one that I can't remember. I can have, I had a lot of fun with these books. Colette's book stack, uh, and I didn't write it down, but it, it was, uh, and the reason I didn't write it down because I didn't feel like she was trying to prove anything to me. Like it really was like, she, she does not care what other people think about the books on, on display That's correct. where I think Tyler, I think, you know what I think it is about a room of one's own with Tyler is, is I'm realizing now, I think she keeps it because yes, once you said it was like from a class, absolutely from a class. And she, she's like, feels some like affinity or would like to feel an affinity with the professor. Like, I think we actually, I feel like that was like, like, it's, it's like, I think she says something to uh, Agatha about like wanting to be like her when she, when she gets older. Yes. Yes. Especially her outfit. Yes. Yeah. She would yeah. love for Agatha to see that book in her room and think that she has a depth that she didn't know of before. And listen, have I kept books on my shelf because they look nice and smart? Absolutely. And I think you hit it on the head with, you know, the journey of feeling judgmental and then going back and forth. And, and I like when books make you have that toggle between emotions. Yeah. The books are almost, you know, books like Bossy Pants, um, Be Before You, they're almost like brand names. And there are a lot of brand names in this book, in this, in this novel, uh, in come and get it. Uh, you know, nobody goes and gets a drink. They get a can of La Croix. Uh, nobody's just putting on a puffer. They're putting on a Patagonia jacket. Uh, the books feel like they're in conversation with that to me anyway. Do they, do they feel like that to you? 100%. I, when I was in graduate school, I felt that there was something missing from the way that me and my students were using consumption choices and I felt like those things didn't really pin down who a person was. And I wanted to look into who people were based on what they felt pushed to buy. Not so much as what they think is cool, but what they respond to in terms of how markets work. Of someone saying, well, I want to be more organized. I want to look smarter. I want to be this. And so, you know, what are the things that that kind of person, person is pushed to consume? So there are a lot of brand names within this work. I personally love when an author just drops me in to a world. I don't want them to explain anything. If I don't get it, I will Google it, but I just want to have these names wash over me and, and make the world really alive. Come and get it is a book about money. And, and that's, that's a, that's a, that's a big statement, but this is, this is a book about, uh, as you said, you, your research assistant digging in to get you specific things. This is a book about specific quantities of money. Um, that's how we understand characters. It's as much about how we understand characters as, as the books on their shelves. Um, we learn, for example, when Millie sees uh, possibly an extra 50 bucks coming her way per month for, for picking up this, uh, you know, this house sitting gig, uh, we learn how she envisions it fitting into her life. She could get a nice haircut. Uh, she could get the big bottle of her conditioner and HBO. <laughs> it would take her to that tier. Um, that I, I love that detail, uh, because the, the increment is so, is so specific and so relatively small, all things considered, but it weighs so much to Millie and yet stands, I think, in contrast to this goal she has of home ownership. because if you're on your way to, to home ownership, 50 bucks isn't like, it, it shouldn't be occupying that much of your, your mind. It's, it's not at the right scale. Tell me about calibrating these values and, and and how it kind of constructs Millie's character. That's a great question. On a basic level, I love to include numbers and sense in real time for, for two reasons. One, I think it's a stylistic choice that I just gravitate towards writing a close third person that reads like a diary entry of someone thinking about their money in real time. When I was in my undergraduate studies, I sat next to this woman named Heather and she would always write out her, her, um, like expenses for the month next to me while we were in class. And obviously that's at the front of her mind. And I feel like that's a normal, real reaction to the limitations of our world. And I wanted to put people like that into my novel. Um, but also just when I'm reading or no, it's more when I'm watching a movie mm -hmm. and someone says, Oh, my, I got a ticket. Oh my God, this is so expensive. I'm like, can you just tell me how much it is? I just want to know yeah. exactly how much it is because whether I think it's a lot 
or a little is immaterial. I want to shape the world and see what your own limitations look like within this sphere. So with this novel, I wanted to dial down the relationship between people's money and their morality, which I think is something that we get caught doing a lot. And I wanted to turn up the very true situation that money can enhance our quality of life. There are so the, the tiniest things will make your life better. Having an extra $20 a week to go out with a friend or to pay for your prescription medication, whatever it is, money can enhance the quality of our lives drastically. And Millie is, is definitely proof of, of how those things affect her life. Millie is a hustler. She wants to save, 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 and just reap the benefits of her hard work in, in ways that make her feel very adult. I wanted Millie to be a realistic young person with very starry-eyed hustle. And that kind of person, I think, would be very aware of what she can do and what she can't do with her money. Can you tell me more about conventional uh, representations of, or the tie between morality and money? What do you mean by that? Oh, boy, you're going to get me in trouble. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't love your answer to this, we can we can just cut it. Oh, that, that's very nice. Well, as someone who reads a lot, I'm, I'm curious what you think as well. I feel there is a lot of literature that focuses on extreme ends of the money spectrum. Mm -hmm. And they often look like, um, like, like succession, very super powerful, rich, top tier, 1% assholes. They are terrible and it almost seems as though they are assholes because of the money that they have and those things just work back and forth. And then the other end is salt of the earth, wonderful, saintly, working hard, extremely low income people who deserve everything and make all of the right decisions, um, but are so low income and can't get out of their situation. I really, you know, of course, can I love a book about rich assholes? 100%. <laughs> Some of my favorite books are about very low income people as well. Um, I was just thinking about Sing Unburied Sing today and, and how much I still love that book. And I think that it can be done well, but I also think that most people are one, living in this in-between area. And those are the kind of people I want to read about. But two, um, poor people can be assholes and rich people can be very, very nice. And I think that that's almost the issue is that us equating morality to the amount of money a person hand has, it gets rid of the nuance of that person as a full human being. And it also shies away from the fact that the problem is not that people are spending well or properly. It's that some people can have everything and some people can have absolutely nothing. So I try to within my books, just because it's what I want to read, stick into a normal, you know, realistic place. Um, and that's people thinking about things like HBO and a haircut. But I also want to give my characters room to have the full human experience of being nice one minute and a jerk the next minute and making sure that that has no relationship to how much money they make. Yeah, I this is I, I love that. I love the detail of it, too. And um, I tend to gravitate. I love books about about where I learn where people are doing a job where mm -hmm. like we're following someone just in their profession, um, that the, the, the action of the novel is pulling them away from, from the humdrum, but we're still with, we're still with them through the humdrum. And yeah, I do love the getting those details, um, that allow you to relate, to understand the stakes. Uh, I have that same annoyance of like, this is so expensive. I'm like, is it $90 or is it $900? Because oh that it's, if, if you're going to show me the character grunting or not when picking up the groceries, like that's also information. It's how much they can physically carry. Um, and it's, it's, it's part of character to know how much they, they can, you know, literally financially carry, like is the money in the bank and how do they feel about it? And that's all part of it. And, and yeah, taking out the numbers is taking out emotional information about character. So I love that it's in here. Speaking of that, there's it, even when the values are the same, there's this there's this issue where Millie it, uh, accepts twenty dollars for arranging for being the fixer who brings the students to Agatha so she can interview them, um, and she's also offered twenty dollars by Tyler 
to to uh, to be a bit of a fixer in making things happen the way she'd like in this in this uh, unusual rooming configuration of the of the three person suite. Um, and the twenty dollars, uh, the twenty dollars is not twenty dollars. It's these are these are these are the same value. It made me actually think of. The, 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 the immediate analogy that came to me was like, I was thinking of in high school physics, we learn that velocity, uh, it's not just distance over time. It's, it's also gonna have a direction. Um, you haven't fully described velocity if you haven't attached a direction. So you could have exactly the same distance over time. The direction still makes a difference. T 20 bucks moving in one direction, moving from someone to someone else for, for one purpose versus from someone else, uh, uh, is, it, the difference matters. Um, can you, can you tell me a little bit about that, about the, about the value, <laughs> the value beyond the value? Yeah. I think I like your, I like your high school <laughs> like math equation with this. I think that that's really well put. Yes. One of my favorite things, and I talk to my students about this a lot is, is the power of magical items within your novel. And I love watching the value of an item change throughout the course of a novel. And the value of a $20 bill was a little bit trickier because there's an actual value on it. It's $20, but the worth of that money becomes really warped in Millie's mind as she feels herself having an attraction for someone, almost wishing that she didn't have the job that she has because it's so difficult because of her feelings. And then later feeling like, like she lost herself in her hustle and taking $20 was not worth what she thought it would would be because it's causing her much more pain than it would otherwise. I do think that a lot of the characters handing Millie these $20 bills are not just doing what they think is right. I think when Tyler hands her $20, she is making a social contract with her. She is saying, you did something for me, but I also see you and I see what you're interested in and you don't have anything over me. I actually have something over you a bit, even though I'm going to pretend that we're friends here. And Millie isn't the only person that Tyler just pays off a little bit. Tyler is often paying other women to behave a certain way. And while Agatha thinks that, you know, Tyler is a bit of a mean girl, she finds that she also sometimes pays women to behave a certain way. So it was very tricky to warp the value of actual dollars and cents. But by the end, Millie comes to the difficult understanding that hard work does not always pay off in the way that you thought it would. And large sums of money do not always feel like they've been earned. Mm. This is, this is of course a, a, uh, this is a campus novel. We are, we are, um, people are enrolled in courses. The, the uh, I, I realize now, as you've mentioned, your research assistant. I'm I'm now seeing through my question, possibly to the answer. These students are majoring in things like apparel merchandising, hospitality management. These these are all paths of study that fit to employment. There's 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 like there's no there's no abstraction. There's no leap you have to make. Uh, the the name of the 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 your your major will appear in your job title. Um, as a humanities grad, as a as an overeducated humanities grad, I could hardly imagine what the day to day course of undergraduate study for these must be like. Um, given also that I'm a middle aged person who has a professional career, and I know how much I had to learn on the job, and how useless it would have been to try to teach me that when I was 21 or whatever. Um, you majored in acting and religious studies, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's true. I imagine these avenues of, of study of these students was were just as alien to you. Can you can you tell me about coming up with their majors? Yes, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, what do you do with the religious studies <laughs> besides say it? But I mean, I think that it really affected my writing and, and my you know interest as a person, but not a straight path there at all. So the majors were a bit like the books in that this was a, another avenue for me to understand what these characters want and what their families want from them and who they see themselves as in like a career type of world. So Millie was very straightforward. She's a hospitality um, major with a minor in Spanish. Um, she's someone who doesn't have a passport, as I don't think I did either until I was mm. 26 years old. But she thinks she's doing all of these things saying, maybe in the future, this is the kind of person that I will be, that I will use my Spanish somewhere else. Um, 
for someone like uh, Tyler, she's the same way. She has a hospitality major as well, but she sees her life going completely differently and probably working in events or PR. I think you can see how differently these, these career, these majors, you know, attract certain people. There's the magic of writing fiction is that you can go into the majors page at the University of Arkansas <laughs> and see certain titles and think that sounds bananas. No one's going to believe that that is a real thing, but they are. And looking into the classes people take and the prerequisites and the books that they read, it was just a great way of understanding what these characters' day-to-day lives look like. I wanted to pick majors for them to show what their interests were, what kind of relationship they had with their families were like. Peyton is another character in the story, and she has a business and accounting major, but she loves food. So her parents have allowed her to have a nutrition minor. Mm. And for me personally, when I meet someone and I hear those choices that they've made, that really just gives them a three-dimensional glow. And I hope the majors in the same way. You have you said in an interview with the Arkansas Times that the misery of really growing up is seeing that your actions can affect other people on a deep level that you can't take back. Um, I wonder if part of growing up uh, or figuring out who you are as an adult is is you know is dealing with that is fi- figuring out how you fix it or what you you, know, you can't take it back but what do you do? You've caused harm now what? I do. I mean, there's so many miseries of growing up, but I do think that that is a big one. I think that so many students enter into their college careers, fading away from their parents, fixing their mistakes in very big ways, and then understanding that you can really hurt the people around you. Um, I think that it is interesting now, the technology, because I think that that realization has been delayed a little bit. Um, you used to say mean things to someone on a playground and then you see their face and you're Mm -hmm. like, Ooh, that didn't feel good to see that. And now a lot of those things can be done through like just sending something off in a text and you're like, Oh, that felt awesome. I'm going to do that again. So I do think that's a, a part that it's, it's a little bit delayed. And when it comes to money too, we, now we just say, you know, I'm going to Venmo request this person and that's it. You don't see the person's desperation of, I actually really need that $20 back. So, so I do think my characters are coming in contact with that in strange ways. I think that as you are learning to grow up, you understand that you have the ability to hurt other people just by being yourself, by not being in love with someone, by not mm-hmm. wanting to invite someone over, or by wanting to leave early or or take a different route home. And I do think that's extremely painful and normal. And hopefully I can continue to write about that because it's something that really fascinates me. Mm-hmm. You spoke about this uh, just a little bit ago, but I want to bring it back. The, um, the, the genre of the campus novel often... Uh, you know, the fact that it's a genre, uh, we, we tend to think it's going to be about power. It's going to be probably about sex. Um, maybe it'll be funny. Um, but it is seldom about money. Um, and, and what's, uh, what's, what's remarkable about come and get it is like once, once you decide money's on the table for discussion, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's unavoidable. Um, do you feel like you've still got more to mine here uh, or, or are you, are you just restless to go write another book and like, you know, the, the, you know, you know what your values are, uh, your aesthetic values of realism and, and, and uh, quotidian, but like, um, do you feel like, yeah, another, another book with some, some numerical values, like catch up with someone like Millie 20 years later. That's interesting. Um, within the campus world, it was such a different type of money. It was in tuition, scholarship, razor bucks, which is the meal plan that the University of Arkansas uses. Um, It was a down payment. It was just so centralized to the characters in that time of life. And like, I think you and I were talking about before, Arkansas is a, or Fayetteville at least, is a very different place. When I lived there in 2016, I would go out with my girlfriends from the coffee shop I worked at and I could take $10 in my pocket and know I could get two or three drinks that night and know I would be fine. I'm not certain that it is still the same place and it hasn't been that long since then. 
And I definitely don't think that you could get a tiny house for 102K anymore. So it was very centralized to where that that time was. Am I done with it? In that circumstance, yes, I, I think that my characters will always be aware of money. That's something that's just stylistically ingrained in me. I think my characters will always have a very open relationship to talk to at least thinking about money. And, and I would love to portray that as well. The one thing I think I've moved on from is I think I've been in young people's heads for a long time. I think I'm ready for some grownups to come back in into my life. Perhaps it's because I'm a mother now myself or just wanting a different a different vibe. I, I also think that I'm getting very far away from youth and I need to properly bow out now <laughs> so I don't make any mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you you started writing uh, "Come and Get It," uh, if I'm not mistaken, before uh, "Such a Fun Age" came out. That's correct. Um, so you had begun this before. Uh, this is you know it's people talk about you know the the follow up or the sophomore or whatever. Um, but for you, this this was already in flight before you realized. Oh wow! I <laughs> wow! Kind of kind of nailed it on the on the first one. What what did what did the kind of that explosion of such a fun age do for you as a writer? It did a few things, but yes, you're right. I was I was ten months under Come and Get It before Such a Fun Age started, so it wasn't a case of me saying, "Okay, I have to repeat the magic here," which I think is a, a dangerous territory. I have a lot of students who get into the habit of wanting to recreate the magic of whatever the piece was that got them into school. They think mm. this represents the best of me and I need to do this again. And that's really not true. With Come and Get It, I had a professor tell me, you know, this one's just for you. You had the big book, do this one just for you, knowing that this book is not going to do what your first one did. And I think that it's, you know, talking to a bookseller, it's kind of nice to, for you to know that someone else understands that 2020 was a year of book buying like no other between the way people were buying books for the pandemic, for a lot of off Black authors like myself who saw a huge raise in sales after the death of George Floyd. It was, it was kind of easy to know my sophomore book is not going to do what my first one did because mm. the world is not the same at all. Like no books are doing what those books were doing. So that was honestly pretty liberating to say, well, if I know that it's not going to do the same thing, I need to write exactly what I want to write here. And I was nervous at how long come and get it was. But then I kept telling myself, what if you have a canon of eight books and such a fun age is this your weird short book that you did at the beginning? That's fine. You have to listen to what you're doing here. And so I kept trying to tell myself for four years, just, just write the book that you want to write. Mm. Uh, that's funny you say length. Cause I, um, of course I, of course I read it, read it digitally. I had no sense of its length. I thought it was, I thought it was short. It, it was, uh, it was, a. Uh, I was, I was, it was, the pace was such that I was kind of greedy about chapters and staying up later than I should have. Um, so it didn't strike me as, as long at all. Well, when I was first writing it, if you can believe it, we were talking earlier about Kennedy's stuff. There was maybe, oh God, there was maybe a hundred and 40 pages more that I think were made up of stuff <laughs> in the first drafts. And my editor rightly pulled me back. There's still a lot of stuff, but not quite as much of a meditation on, on consumption. There are two epigraphs in Come and Get It. One is from Lucy Biederman's book, The Walmart Book of the Dead, a book of, of I, I, I guess we, we would call it prose poetry, um, about consumerism and and it's aptly titled as, as it ties consumption and, and, um, and metaphysics. The other is from Sam Walton's book, which is entitled Sam Walton made in America. Of course, nowhere in the subtitle does it mention that he is the late founder of Walmart. Uh, it's a really nice sentiment. It's something about like, it's something about teamwork and we do it all together. Can you tell me about these epigraphs, these, these, these dueling voices on the first page? Absolutely. So in the beginning stages of writing, I wanted to consume all things Arkansas. So Walmart was founded in Bentonville and which is 45 minutes or so away from Fayetteville. And the Walton family name is like a made in China sticker. That's kind of all over Fayetteville from schools to theaters, to grocery stores, to the university, Walmart and Walton family is everywhere. I discovered Lucy's book from listening to another podcast where it was mentioned and it's this book of spells that dips in and out of people's lives as they go to Walmart and 
fight with their mothers and stay at home making dinner. And it is the perfect book to keep by the side of your bed. And the epigraph, which I believe, I don't want to butcher it too much, but it says, um, I don't want to spend eternity with the lights off. I'll buy the most expensive bulbs, not buy them with my Amex. And it was just such a perfect opening for this book that's very much about buying things and wanting to buy the absolute best things and and wanting to feel like you deserve them. And then with Sam Walton, it just felt great to pair these two together. I believe the quote is, um, that's the secret. We're all working together. And there's a lot of secrets here. There's a lot of people working together, whether they want to or not in this book. And so I was really thrilled to put them together. And I'm happy to say that I reached out to Lucy, who I did not know was a fan of such a fun age. And we're friends now. And she loves being paired with the man, as she says. So she's a great writer. I love it. I guess it also ties... This is another, this is another, I, I couldn't help but notice that some of the, the books, um, as we go back to the discussion of the book bouquets, uh, you had included books, I think by, by writers, I think Jojo Moyes and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie had blurbed you generously. Some part of my bookseller brain was like, oh, there's, we've, we filed these things. We've got cross references here. I'm happy to say that Jojo is a friend as well. And she's just as delightful as you would think she is. And so, which is so funny because I just saw her and I did not mention that one of my characters had her book in her room. Yes, there's a lot of meta things happening here. <laughs> Kylie, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been so fun to talk books. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I have been speaking with Kylie Reed, author of a new novel, Come and Get It. Find it and all the books we spoke about, all the books we spoke about. I've got quite a task ahead of me putting together the notes here. It's going to be at Kobo and Conversations home on the web, kobo.com slash conversation. There's a link in the show notes. Subscribe in your podcast player to catch every episode. And if you enjoyed this one, uh, tell somebody who makes you feel like you're 24 again, uh, but only in a good way. This episode of Kobo in Conversation was produced and hosted by me, Nathan Maharaj. Thank you for listening. Selfishly want to ask you one more question while we're on books. Just yeah. I don't get to talk to booksellers in this way too so often. How do you, I'm curious about your other books that you might enjoy that have books in them. Books with books are really interesting to me. Oh, wow. Well, here now we're up against the limits of my memory um, because I actually like, yeah, no, I can't think of any that would be. Yeah, no, I think I wind up, I wind up getting an impression. It would, it would be the kind of thing where I have an impression of a book and I have an impression of a character in the book. And I would only discover that how much of my impression of them is colored by their books. Once, once reminded that what we learned about their bookshelves, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm afraid I have, I'm, I have nothing no, but disappointment for a, you here. That's a thesis project. I'm so sorry. The one that was on my mind recently was, uh, the history of love by Nicole Krauss. I don't know if you read that. One. I haven't read it. No, there's, there's like pages and pages of another book within that book and it's they're beautiful so i am up to the challenge of listing books actually have <laughs> the text from another book is something i'm not going to try yet but i'm always intrigued when authors try i mean i'm waiting for somebody to have like uh to do like cross fictional books like i want like like um uh john irving's like uh, the book garp writes the the pension grill parser i want that to show up in a book somewhere on somebody's shelf and then i get i get then i don't know what that says about them it says it says they're in a john irving novel is actually what it says yeah. <laughs>